Mr. Michael Wilson. Thank you very much. Excellent. And we are still at the University of Technology, Jamaica, with the sixth annual Joan Duncan Memorial Lecture. And the topic, this is not a concert. Um, the topic of the lecture this evening is reducing corruption and its impact on Jamaica's development. And yesterday, I heard someone on the radio talking in Jaina. There was so much passion. And I said, this is going to be something else. But Kim, I'm not doing your work. I'm going to now ask Mrs. Kim Mayer, Chief Executive Officer, JMMD Joan Duncan Foundation, to introduce our keynote speaker, Mrs. Mayer. Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Hector Velo, members of the council, Dr. Haldon Johnson, representing President Professor Stephen Vassiani, our GMMB Chairman, Archie Campbell, Mrs. Patricia Sutherland, Chairman of the GMMB Joan Duncan Foundation and the Duncan family, GMMB team members, UTEC team members and family, specially invited guests, members of the media, Viewers joining us on cable via JNN, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Executive Director of the Jamaica Accountability Meter Portal and member of the Jamaica Civil Society Forum, Jeanette Calder has been consistently vocal and fully engaged in governance issues in Jamaica, particularly those relating to procurement, corruption, and public sector reform. Ms. Calder's contributions have included researching and producing Jamaica's first simplified since change budget and guide, as well as conducting research into the work of the Auditor General of Jamaica to identify gaps and weaknesses in the country's accountability framework. She is an architect by training and a technical consultant and trainer for the execution of public-private partnerships. Her period of study and later employment at the Institute for Housing and Urban Development at the Erasmus University in the Netherlands focused on public-private partnerships for improved delivery in the public sector. Ms. Calder spent many years managing the Government of Jamaica's Joint Venture Housing Programs in the Ministry of Housing, where she was confronted with numerous challenges that encumbered effective public sector management. Her service on a number of government boards and committees include the National Contract Commission's Sector Committee, the Rent Board, the Land Divestment Board, among others which furthered her appreciation for the threat to responsive public service delivery and left an indelible impression about the need for change. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in warmly welcoming civil society advocate Jeanette Calder to present the sixth annual Joan Duncan Memorial Lecture, Reducing Corruption and Its Impact on Jamaica's Development. Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank each and every one of you who exercised the option of deciding to be here this evening. I see some friends in the audience, and they will tell you that uh, unabashedly, I will speak as passionately and as long as I have a crowd of one. <laughs> I, but it's really good to see um, plurality this evening, and I'm really grateful you are investing your time in hearing what I have to say, and that's one of the things I can't give you back, is the time you've invested. So I'm really anticipating that it will be well spent. It's not my first time. I have been in the audience before, and it has always been a well-spent evening here with the JMMB family. So I do want to thank 
of that family and the Joan Duncan Foundation for inviting me to be here for the sixth year. One of the reasons it, it turned out to be so fortunate is that when you have to present, you actually end up learning a lot in the process. And I did learn some more. In addition, I learned a lot more about Joan Duncan herself. And I'm really hoping that there's a project ahead where there's a little docudrama or a book about your mother's life. There's a lot that we can draw on. I would really like to mention that um, in my bio, there's the absence of something I'm very proud of, and that is I am a graduate of the University of Technology. Thank you. <laughs> I am a graduate. I, the class of 97 from the Caribbean School of Architecture. Thank you very much. And it was four wonderful years here. It's amazing the journey. Who knew that I would have become what we call a civil society advocate? It was just down the road. I practically lived at the third building of the, the third floor of the building department. But it's amazing you know that you have really gotten good schooling and education where you can transfer those skills. What I am doing now is literally building on foundations that have been laid by many persons who are even here tonight. And I really thank them for coming and for what they have already done. But it's also really about thinking of an idea and a concept and being able to follow that process and the rigor that it requires to take it out of the realm of the thought to the paper and then to have it manifest in reality. And we are co-creators of Jamaica's future. So I'm literally transferring those skills from the building department to the process that not just I, but I'm hoping that you are going to be a part of soon. So thank you very much, UTEC. It was not a waste of time. You will communicate that to, to, to Professor Vassiani for me. Now I'm gonna have to do a little bit of shifting around because I do need to view the monitor and this podium is blocking me. I'm not as tall as I thought I was. So if you'll pardon me while I gather some things here and do a little bit of a shift. My check. Pat said a lot of things this evening that reminded me a lot of what I want to share with you today. And it is a little difficult for me to speak on the subject of corruption largely because it tends to be phrased in the negative. I tend to have a preference to speak about accountability. I remember reading once, I think it was Mother Teresa who said, if you're gonna invite me to a anti-war protest, I'm not gonna come, but if you invite me to a peace concert, I will be there. <laughs> But the truth is that the door to fixing corruption for me is accountability, but the title has been set and I'm gonna work with it today. Now, just wanted to take a look at that. I'm sorry your screen is not as lovely as the one I'm looking at here, but the question that's really being posed to all of us tonight is what is she worth to you? What is Jamaica worth to you? What does she mean? She has nourished us, she has nurtured us, she has done so much for us. The question now is what are we gonna do for her? Now, in thinking and wrapping my mind around the thoughts I wanted to share tonight, three words kept coming back to me. The people and their perspectives, the problem and the possibilities. And that's the beauty of it. When you have a problem, there is always room for possibilities to be extracted from that tonight. And in as much as I've really always enjoyed coming to talks like this, I have to admit that by the time I've wrapped my head around the problem, I kind of leave looking like this. <laughs> So I'm really hoping tonight that I can offer some hope and that we will be encouraged by what I believe is an idea that JAMP will be bringing to the people of Jamaica. Now, it was a little presumptuous of me to think that I could possibly wrap just my head around the question about corruption, the impact, and whether or not we can make a dent to it. So a friend challenged me to head out on the streets of Jamaica and to talk to other Jamaicans about what they thought. And that is why we started People and Their Perspectives, yeah? And I thought it would be really good to share with you. I talked to about 18 people over the last six days, you know, the security guard at the bank, the cashier at the local hardware, three teenagers down in the food court at Sovereign, and it was profound. And I wouldn't be able in the interest of time to get into it with you, but these were the questions that I asked them. When you hear the word poverty, what comes to mind? And when you hear the word corruption, not just what comes to mind, but how does it make you feel? And then I asked, do you think we're ever gonna be able to make a dent in this problem? And I was pleasantly surprised. I think I'm gonna have to change my company because I went on the street expecting not much hope. But with the 18 Jamaicans I spoke to, only two persons thought that there wasn't a chance. I said, yes, Jeanette, you're gonna have to change the company you're keeping. And then I asked, is there any contribution that you can make 
And last but by no means least, what do you think corruption is? Because we really do have a difference of opinion as to what this is, and it was a fascinating engagement. So I'm gonna share a few with you before I get into the statistics, as Pat said. Not having an ID, well, that took me aback immediately. What does it mean? Poverty means not having an ID. And then he elaborated. Well, when you don't have an ID, you know, ma'am, police call you boy. But when you have an ID, you become sir. It was about respect, and he saw poverty as a lack of respect. I get goosebumps still, just reflecting on it. When I asked him about corruption, he had one word. Government. The second person I spoke to said Rivertown. That too surprised me. So I said to him, do you mean the shelter or the waste management problem? And these were his words. When you're looking at the people living off the waste generated by the city, you must be looking at poverty. And I thought, what a definition. Exactly. He turned out to be a 28-year-old university graduate who had grown up in the inner city thanks to his grandmother and education. Now he's working and doing well, employed, and wants to be a politician. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Pat. <laughs> and he said to me, the only thing stopping him is his wife says, I'm not marrying no priest, no pastor, and no politician. But he's planning to call her bluff, he says. When he thinks of corruption, he says, my money comes to mind. I said to him, really, Mr. every time I hear the story, I think, my money. An 18-year-old in ninth grade said to me, she thinks of hunger, especially when you cannot feed children. And for her, corruption was just plain ugliness, just government in control. One person in Burger King said to me, it's a mind thing, it's not your pocket, it's your attitude. Now, gentle folks, there are books written about this. Wayne Dyer, books upon books upon books, and he grasped this in a way that I thought was just, wish I could tell you how the rest of that conversation went. I spoke to a policeman at Kingston Night Market last week, Tuesday, and he says every time he hears the word, it's disappointment, which in and of itself is not a bad thing, because that's a function of expectation, which means he still has hope. But the words that followed was, it's everywhere, ma'am, and it makes me wonder if it's going to be me sometime soon. He had been in, in, on duty in Kingston for one year, and based on what he saw, he thought that it was pretty much omnipresent, and it was a matter of time before he got caught up in corruption. Now let's just think about this while I take a sip. Huh? Now, my last was a gentleman who I thought was a young business executive, not looking very different from Dr. Haldane. So I thought, great, a broad cross-section of people. Let me hear it from somebody who is, you know, a little bit more. And he said to me, poverty is when a gunman robs you of everything, everything you have at six years old. Now, you know we tend to judge off appearance, and I was guilty of doing it. So I thought, at six years old, you got robbed. The gunman broke in and what, stole your Nintendo? I'm not kidding, these are the things that came to mind. And then he said, no, it was my father. And I was really struck. He grew up in Jonestown with a grandmother and only had a father and gunmen came in and killed his father in front of him. Now you know that totally threw the conversation off whack. And he said corruption for him represented politicians and the gunmen because them youth that can't buy food, so how on earth can they buy guns and bullets? And that's the last one I will share with you, but I'm happy to tell you that he had three siblings. They've all done exceptionally well. He just, la he just helped the last ones through NCU nursing. But he said the one good thing that came out of it was the fact that he met his mother for the first time. Of course, you know, I cheered up at hearing that, but then only to hear that she was mentally ill walking the road naked. The day after his father died, they took him to meet his mother. But he is an overcomer, and he has done a marvelous job of overcoming, and I'm sure if time allowed me to share more of that conversation with you, you would understand a little bit more of the resilience of the Jamaican people. Now, that is looking at it from the, thank you, Pat, from the perspective of the Jamaicans on the street, but every single one of them, except for two, knew that there was hope and actually told me of the things that they were doing to fight corruption in their community and in their families and in their homes. Before I segue to the next slide, I'm going to just give you a little insight into Dwayne Kamani. He says he has an eight-year-old son. And what he did 
in March was to sit him down in front of the budget debate with a dictionary and walked away and told him to listen. Isn't that amazing? But that is the beginning of turning this thing around. Now I want to look at the perspective of another Jamaican. Her name is Mrs. Pamela Mono Ellis. You would know her as the Auditor General of Jamaica, who I think has been doing a marvelous job very quietly in her own space. Now, as I've segued to the problem, naturally, I'm going to look at a couple of the reports and a little bit of a snippet so that we can just focus our mind on the nature and the depth of the part of a couple of the reports and a little bit of a snippet so that we can just focus our mind on the nature and the depth of the problem that we're having. These are actually highlights from a body of research that I did with the Jamaica Civil Society Coalition in partnership with the Caribbean Vulnerable Communities Coalition in 2016. And it's actually the findings of that report that has actually given birth to the work that I'm doing now and the organization that has been founded to take the findings of that report a little bit further. Now, <laughs> this is a, I call it the Auditor General scrapbook, but if you look at the headlines, and usually when I have time, I would ask persons in the audience to guess when were these articles written? And invariably, it never passed more than about five years. But if you take a look, yes, wow indeed. It's really stunning. And I'm not, a, I'm not shy to tell you it's not changing. If I were to read the details of that 1958 report on the parish accounts, that's pre-independence. It wouldn't sound any different from the Auditor General's report looking at the local government today. That Belsley report in 1991, we have one as recently as 10 years after. Nothing has changed, but it will change. And I want to take you on a little bit of a journey to some of the highlights of what is happening, what she's sharing with us, and the question about what have we been doing with this work that this watchdog agency has actually been extracting a, a lot of value in terms of um, how we handle governance and how we handle ourselves and our money. Now, here we have an example in 2014 where $1.78 billion and you are all aware of the problems we're having with water right now. $1.78 billion was transferred from a K-Factor account. To keep it short, the K-Factor account can only be utilized for pumps and pipes, not for light and water and paying salaries. Now, you can't remove from that account without the OUR's approval. $1.78 billion was removed. And when the Auditor General went and audited, she could only find $73 million in receipts. In 2015, we borrowed $8.6 billion in the middle of a time when we were tightening our belts with the IMF, the HAV, HAG, sorry, we borrowed from China. We contracted with China. The project we done, we were supposed to provide 2,517 lots, 900 and, sorry, 937 units, yes, 2,517 lots. It started, the contract was signed, no feasibility studies were done, the designs were incomplete, naturally that means overruns of money and time. Take a look at that. At the end, when the Auditor General went in, 867 units, that's over 90%, were incomplete, and 21% of the lots were, but all funds were already paid out to the contractor. Institute of Sports, this is a matter of governance. We cannot put a figure on some of these because we can't tell how much leakage. But in 23 years, the Institute of Sports has never submitted a financial statement to the government. Every year, they are allocated funds, and not once in 23 years have they ever said to the government, this is what we have done with the funds. You will notice it says that the audit committee has never met. The Ports Authority, some of us are more familiar with this. It's as recent as 2017. A senior officer benefited from three pensions. You see the value and a gratuity <laughs> totaling $31.33 million. Any, would anybody like to guess what I'm going to say for 2018, last year? Anybody? Anybody? You are so wrong. <laughs> I thought because that has been so well ventilated, I would show you why it is that we really need to pay attention. Because only a couple of months before we heard about Petrogram, the newspaper carried the National Insurance Fund. Now, everybody knows we take NIS, and this is for all of us, yeah? It's a social security. This is one of the most vulnerable parts of the population. 
But in 2018, $3.1 billion was invested by the National Insurance Fund without any due diligence, without any due process. Not only that, but the investment committee never approved it, the board never gave approval, and neither did the Ministry of Finance. Now, can anybody tell me how we spend $3.1 billion without that level of gateway review? And everybody's still sitting at their desks and working, what, some 15 months later? Yeah. Last, but by no means least, just last month, I think this might have gone over our heads because it was the same week that the state of emergency was reinstated in St. James, but we had the Jamaica Constabulary Force where $1.8 billion was spent over two years and 81% of those contracts was just about me saying, hey, can you provide meals for us? No tenders, hey, how much will it cost to repair the cars and maintain the offices? Here's a contract, $1.8 billion. Now, I'm hoping that gives you an idea of just a snippet of the things that the Auditor General is saying to the country, but we have not been paying sufficient attention. I'm gonna close this section by sharing with you a quotation from a public accounts member of the committee. He said, and I saw this in a transcript, we can't have the repetition of this kind happening every year. It just continues in department after department. And if you were to add it up, you will know that you cannot run GMMB like that. <laughs> you would never. He says, I would not run my business like that. And that's the point. It's not our funds, so therefore the way in which we make decisions is a little bit or a lot lighter than it should have been. Now, when I went to study, I had, as Kim shared with you, I had spent quite a bit of time in the joint venture well, in joint venture with the Ministry of Housing. It's a partnership between the public sector and the private sector at the time to provide more middle-income housing. But once I started studying, I fell in love with infrastructure. I moved from housing to infrastructure because I realized that infrastructure is not just about the economics of what it does to a country, but it's a moral obligation that we have because light and water are life and death issues. The ability to drive from your home to a hospital in under half an hour is a life and death issue. So it became about a moral obligation that we have to provide quality public goods and services. Now every one of us in this room depended on public goods and services even before we were born. From the day you were in the womb, that care that your mother had, whether she had to go to a prenatal clinic for the government, you were already dependent on the quality goods and services that the government supplies. And this is why corruption really it's something that I get passionate about. It's not an abstract term. It really is about the quality of lives of everybody in here. And everything that we can do to correct that is going to be worth our time and energy. But what is corruption? One of the things I found by being on the street is that there were persons who really didn't have the, the correct understanding of what it was. A gentleman looked at me and said, well, ma'am, it's not when you steal out of need, you know, it's just when you steal out of greed. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> and there was a gentleman who said to me, well, it's not when you thief some ketchup if you work down a grace. So there are all different kinds of ideas as to what it is. Very basically, it's the abuse of public office for private gain. That is how it is referred to internationally. But I'm going to be honest with you. I like the way it's defined in the Corruption Prevention Act of Jamaica. It says when a public official solicits or accepts whether directly or indirectly, an article or money, and that's very important. A lot of persons tend to associate it only with money. A benefit being a gift, a favor, a promise, or an advantage, and it doesn't have to be for yourself. It's a friend or a family. And then there's the other thing that's very interesting. It's also about not just what you do, but it's also about what you don't do. And that happens a lot. It's when you turn your head, when there is something happening there that you should be looking at and you should be reporting. Now that's what corruption is. Now, as it relates to the cost of corruption, we're gonna start first by looking at the impact. Transaction costs for those coming into Jamaica to do business. Now, when I speak about transaction costs, let's use a house, for example. You might think it's just the price of the house, but no, it's actually all the costs that you will face in buying that house. So it's the cost of the attorney, maybe the realtor, 
maybe if you had to ask a cousin to fly down and look at the house, basically it's everything that you have to do to actually get this business done. So just picture for a minute a housing developer. I'm going to stay in my lane for where I'm comfortable. And there is so much interface between somebody wanting to do a development in housing here between that businessman and the public sector, the public officials. And at every step of the way to get licensing, to get permitting, to get approval, that is where the opportunity presents itself for corruption. And what we have come to understand is that as long as it takes too much time and there are too many steps involved in the bureaucracy, then it increases the likelihood that frustration is going to build and people who don't even want to be corrupt are going to find themselves in a position where they might. So it increases the cost of doing business because people begin to let off. And the difficulty for persons coming into Jamaica is that businessmen like predictability in cost. They like to know what they're going to anticipate. Now, believe it or not, there are some countries where they know ahead of time exactly what they're going to have to pay under the table. Yeah? In Jamaica, there's a sliding scale. <laughs> you never know who, you never know when. But it makes it very difficult, so that's the first thing, the unpredictability. The second thing is that it distorts what we call sectoral priorities. Now, there's always this rustling at the time of the budget about how much is going to go into social programs versus how much is going to go into capital spending. Where do you think most of the corruption occurs? Capital. So there is the peddling of influence sometimes by the businessman who is anticipating that there's going to be more put into capital, not just because the country needs infrastructure, because there's going to be an opportunity for him to benefit. Another is what we call the privatization of public policy. Now, most of us are familiar with the idea of privatization of public assets. But in this case, you will have a situation where laws are passed or not passed in the interest of private businesses. I don't know if you're familiar with the term beneficial ownership. But Jamaica did something really significant, I believe it was in 2017, when we amended the law that prevented business people from hiding behind a veil of anonymity. We need to know when the funds are being generated in a company, who is benefiting ultimately. And you could register a company, you would have Dr. Haldane Johnson as the legal owner, and you would never know that Jeanette Calder is actually benefiting from that income. Can you begin to see how that would create an environment that facilitates illegitimate businesses? Well, in 2017, we removed that, preventing it. And this is one of the things that I would want to applaud the government for, because that would have been a law that would have facilitated all kinds of evil, but we have kind of cauterized that at the moment. La well, not last, but the next one is antisocial behaviors. I don't have to spend any time on that. We're all pretty familiar with how corruption leads to crime and violation of human rights. Bribery, nepotism, cronyism, we tend to look at the statistics in terms of a dollar value. But the moral fabric of Jamaica is being impacted in a way that is very disturbing. I'll share with you that during the last election, one of the things that disappointed me was how little we talked about the social concerns of Jamaica vis-a-vis -vis the pocket concerns of Jamaica. But I don't think this is something I need to elaborate on. We see it cropping up in a number of the Auditor General's reports, even in dealing with Petrodam. My concern, if I give you a simple example, is if when you're in the traffic and you see that taxi man who overtakes all of us to get ahead, after a couple of taxi men, what do you see happening? A private. He just noticed all of a sudden, now why should I sit here if he can? And I'm convinced that that is not limited to just how we drive on the road. The minute you begin that creeping compromise, it begins to show up in other aspects of your life. And that is why I'm particularly concerned about that impact. Reduce tax collection. Every single development report that you read will tell you that when you go to a country that's having a problem with governance and corruption, look at the tax collection. There's a direct relationship between the two, and that I'm sure is the case here for us here in Jamaica. And last, overriding regulation. Hmm. Building codes, environmental controls, prudent banking regulations, and taxation. I believe they say that there are four main categories where we run into trouble. Basically, when you over-regulate, you think you're trying to be good. 
you're trying to police the activity of private citizens. But when you do that, what do you think is also happening? When you have layers and layers of more steps and more passages about how you can do business, exactly, you gotta find a shortcut. So the four areas where this tends to, to turn up is in taxation, is in business startups, how long it takes you to get that done, in licensing, and in property registration. So those are some of the main ones I wanted to share with you in terms of the impact that it is having. Now, it is all about influence peddling that there are members of the private sector, private citizens, who have a kind of access that facilitates the kind of flow, and money, flow of money that denies us in terms of the quality goods and services that we can provide. Now, I just wanted to quickly give us a case study to let us know, guys, we can do this. There are countries around the world that are doing far worse than we are in governance that's moving ahead in leaps and bounds. Now, I don't know if you follow the case of the car wash scandal, but it started in 2016, and Dilma Rousseff was actually impeached. She wasn't impeached because of the scandal. Time does not permit me to go into the details, but it was massive impropriety in terms of contracts that were being signed, big contracts, many, many companies benefiting, and it wasn't limited to just this country. It actually ricocheted throughout the entire Latin America. It actually brought 